The head of the Taliban says he's committed to ending the decades-old war in Afghanistan, even as insurgents battle in dozens of districts across the country to gain territory. To discuss this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, joining us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, the statement came as Taliban leaders were meeting with high-level Afghan government delegation in Qatar to jumpstart stalled peace talks. Tell me more. Yeah. Uh, talk about Jekyll and Hyde, right? The Taliban, they are very much uh, agreeable to all kinds of ceasefires and deals and will come to the negotiating table with the United States and with the Afghan government. But their other hand is in terrorism and in suicide bombings and blowing up places where Afghan civilians live. So, you know, how can we trust them as a partner uh, to take Afghanistan into the future, to help them nation build, to help them out of this turmoil that they've been in for decades and decades? Uh, it's, it's a really sad situation. And the unfortunate part is, I mean, the question begs, right? Why are we dealing with the Taliban? Why do the Afghans deal with the Taliban if this is the partner that they're showing themselves to be? Well, well, the answer is that they are the only game in town and their influence is so tremendously significant that they have to deal with them uh, because if they don't deal with them, there will still be this enemy uh, within the, the state of Afghanistan. So, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a catch-22. It's a situation that the Afghan government find them, finds themselves in uh, and the United States did as well. We saw them as a, a legitimate partner. Um, and of course, they are a terrorist organization. Organization. So we see this back and forth, um, all, you know, a, for a long time now, and we'll see if they ultimately come up with some sort of semblance of peace for the future. You know, a few political pundits looked at the Afghan government as basically being a puppet regime under the Taliban once the U.S. troops completely pull out. What are you hearing? Absolutely right. Absolutely right. We don't even have to wait for the U.S. to pull out. When the announcement was made that the U.S. and the European allies were going to pull out, uh, that gave the Taliban free reign. I mean, look, they saw it as free reign before the fact, but now it's even, you know, um, a much, much more free hand for them to really exercise all kinds of terrorism and to have the influence on all sectors of life. And as you said, the Afghan government serving as just a figurehead and nothing more. Uh, for the government there. Lisa, Lebanon is going through one of its worst economic depressions in modern day history. More than half of the country's population now lives in poverty and the Lebanese currency has dropped 90%. Fuel shortages have even led to fights at gas stations and the Middle Eastern state is on the brink of a social explosion. Now, speaking of terrorist organizations, Hezbollah stands to gain the most during these tumultuous times, don't they? Yep, absolutely. So all throughout the Middle East and elsewhere, uh, whenever we see some sort of collapse, and it's usually economic, right, uh, we, we always look at the the vacuum, the power vacuum well, that will be created uh, once there is this kind of, of turmoil. And in Lebanon specifically, there has been a, pol a political vacuum. Uh, the country has been leaderless for a very long time. And as we saw protests on the streets there, uh, they are about the economic downward spiral that they're experiencing, but it's also about the chaos. It's about the lack of leadership. It's about the fact that Hezbollah, a proxy of the Iranian regime, a terror organization, has run rampant there. It's a cancerous element within their society, and they can't rid themselves of this cancerous element. So uh, experts are warning now that, that Lebanon is at this crucial point, uh, the, only, the only person, or the only, I should say, the only group that has to gain is Hezbollah and its leaders. Uh, and they will, for a fact, take advantage of this, this political upheaval and try to uh, exert themselves on on all sectors of society. This is where, you know, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, Hezbollah, this is where they come in. The Taliban also, as we just talked about, this is where they come in and they put up the soup kitchens and they pay for people's education. And that's where they indoctrinate and that's where they radicalize and that's where they take over segments of the population. This is how radicalization happens. So that's why there is this stern warning for the future of Lebanon. Now, when it comes to Iran, their goal is to silence us or intimidate us. Those are your words, Lisa. You say the Iranian regime is not afraid to go after North American citizens to really prove their point, including a recent plot to kidnap a New York-based Iranian-American journalist. 
Yes, this conversation comes to light because of this recent plot. But as you know, Hal, in Canada, in the United States, all over Europe, there have been previous uh, plots, whether foiled or actually carried through, where the Iranian regime sends its bullies that it finds on the ground. It, it, it pays these thugs to do its dirty work here in North America. Uh, this is a stern wake-up call. You know, journalists like myself who have been covering the region for a very long time, we have faced hacking and threats and, and intimidation of all sorts in order to silence us, in order for us not to expose their heinous crimes, whether it's in human rights or support of terror or its continuation of its nuclear program. So, um, you know, let this plot be a wake-up call to all of us here in North America. We have a mini Iran at our southern border in Venezuela and uh, in Bolivia and Brazil and Argentina, all throughout South America, Venezuela being its biggest headquarters. But, uh, you know, Iran is not the bully that's far, far away. It's actually closer than we think. When they're able to find and hire investigators and others to do their dirty work and, and come after citizens of North America, then we have a, a lot of uh, waking up to do to, to really understand what this threat is. Violence continues during a second night of protests over severe water shortages in southwestern Iran, including a man who was killed. Lisa, government official, however, says the death was just an accident. Yeah, that's what they always say, right? Um, the death toll now is uh, reportedly higher than that. And again, Hal, you know that we don't have any way of properly verifying this. These, this is through citizen reports, um, civilian reports. And, uh, you know, the government will deny, deny, deny. And, and, and the media there is, is, is state-controlled media, so it's very difficult to get a proper gauge. Uh, in 2019, they had very serious protests, and they said that a couple hundred protesters were killed, when in fact we know that that number is 15 hundred or higher. So in this case, look, when there's when they start to crack down uh, at, uh, in a violent way, they're cracking down because they want this to stop. They know that it starts out as a water protest, but it continues on with all the disenchantment and all the grievances that people have about the government as a whole. You know, it, you know, we start out with slogans saying we need water and it, it turns out to be, you know, death to the dictator. So, you know, it evolves very quickly because the people only come out when they are so fully disenchanted, that they're willing to risk their lives, they're willing to lose their jobs or lose their place in university to go out and protest. Um, and that's what we're seeing. You know, I, I thank you for bringing this up. I know a lot of media outlets aren't covering these protests, but they're incredibly significant and more so significant because the Western world is busy and focused on striking a deal with the Iranian regime where you see the Iranian citizens in the country of Iran and what they're dealing with and these human rights abuses, and none of this is brought to light. None of the dots are connected to say, what are we doing at the negotiating table with such an unworthy partner? Uh, and I think we should really be underscoring a lot of these other stories. Now, still with Iran, the country's deputy foreign minister in a recent tweet accused the U.S. and British governments of holding a proposed prisoner swap hostage over negotiations for the 2015 Iran nuclear deal. A spokesperson with the U.S. State Department slammed Iran, calling the claim outrageous. <laughs> you know how, let's say this claim were to be true. They, I mean, look, they have every right to hold anything they want um, until they get some sort of deal, meaning we don't have to deal with you. We don't have to do a prisoner swap. We don't have to release the sanctions. And we don't have to sit at the negotiating table with you. I think the Iranian regime has... has read into a very, very gullible partner in the White House. Um, of course, that's because Joe Biden and Kamala Harris campaigned on the fact that they're going to make nice and, and appease the Iranian regime, but think they've gone a little overboard. Uh, they are chest thumping to the extent where even the State Department and the White House here in the United States have taken a step back to say, we're not going to deal with you until X, Y, and Z. And of course, the Iranian regime is not backing down. You know, the, the juxtaposition that I always make is, look, in 2005, under President Obama, we had an Iran nuclear deal, and it was not a good deal. But what we did have was at least an Iranian regime that pretended that it cared about being more moderate, about human rights, about making some sort of behavioral change. Now that's all out the window. You have a rogue Iranian regime who is so brazen and so confident in really sticking it to the Americans and everyone else at the negotiating table in Vienna to say, we're the ones who are going to call the shots because you guys want this deal so, so badly. So they'll have to wait for the prisoner exchange. They'll have to wait for the sanctions to be 
removed, hopefully, because we're hearing some reports out of the White House that they may be removed uh, sometime soon. But we hope to see some sort of change and a, a change in rhetoric more so than anything else and hopefully behavior out of Iran. Lisa, Cuban-Americans, especially in Florida, are showing support for Cuba's fight for freedom. Many are speaking out against the Castro regime, which is leaving people poor, hungry, and frustrated by lack of jobs. Right. Listen to them. Listen to the Cuban Americans and listen to the Cubans in Cuba telling us their story. Don't listen to AOC. Don't listen to these socialist uh, sympathizers who uh, wouldn't last a day in a place like Cuba. Uh, you know, the, if you go on Twitter, it kind of, you know, it ages you because you're listening to all of this, um, you know, this, the, these tweets that, that are, you know, sent by people who are just sitting comfortably in their homes in the United States. Um, or elsewhere, I should say. This is a, a more of a Western Hemisphere issue, um, and you know, just saying, you know, that, that they're 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 socialists. It's the best thing in the world. There was a, a tweet last night that said the best government in the world is a socialist government. Well, you know, ask the socialists, and that's what it comes down to. Ask the people in Miami who are from Cuba who fled that government. Ask people who came to the United States and Canada and elsewhere for a better life. Uh, and, you know, when, when you look at the realities on the ground there, and then you look at so many of the lawmakers in this country that are so tone deaf about the freedoms, I think the, on the bottom line here is that the, the protesters in Cuba, many of them are holding American flags. And that says a lot. It says the America still to them is the symbol of freedom and liberty. And we should remember that. The land flowing with milk and honey. Lisa, oil producing nations have agreed to increase their output with the aim of reducing prices and easing the pressure on the world economy. The OPEC cartel and partners, including Russia, will boost supply in August after prices climbed to a two and a half year high during the pandemic. I mean, we saw the price of Brent crude go up to up 43 percent this year to around $74 U.S. per barrel. It has since come down quite a bit. Yes, um, you know, a much needed correction, obviously, ask people here who go to the pump and have SUVs, uh, what they're paying uh, to fill up their cars. Uh, this is uh, obviously in the in the aftermath of the pandemic, we're talking, you know, supply and demand, and now, uh, you know, trying to ease this. Again, this is summertime, a lot of people taking road trips, a lot of people really feeling the pinch at the pump. Uh, and as you said, we're up to 70 some, some dollars uh, a barrel. And and um, hopefully, if it comes down, we'll see some relief at the pump as well. Yeah, so far it's coming down about 8 or $9 U.S. per barrel. Lisa, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad took the oath of office for a fourth consecutive term in war-ravaged Syria. He won around 95% of the vote in an election that was dismissed around the world. And shortly before the ceremony, rockets fired by pro-government forces killed six people, including three children, in the country's last major rebel bastion. Oh, my goodness. You know, I, you can't believe any of the news that comes out of Syria, unfortunately, because it is just a Bashar al-Assad, you know, mouthpiece um, that just, you know, props him, his regime, and of course, the Iranian regime that stands behind it and the Russians who stand behind it. Uh, there's so many different layers here in Syria. And if you believe that he won with a 95% uh, win, I have a bridge to sell you, as they say. So, um, you know, a, a lot of propaganda, you know, they, they don't, it's, it's, it's funny because people don't believe them anymore. Obviously, if you're going to, you know, proclaim yourself a leader for the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time, just like we have Putin in Russia, well, you don't need to come out and say 95% voted for you. It's just absurd to even believe that or to think that. So, um, you know, that's a place where, you know, it's been abandoned by the West for many reasons because it was an endless war, an endless war but you still have so many victims that stay behind, like these children, like the families, uh, like the Kurds uh, and, and many others who are there and fighting for their lives. So, um, you know, it's it's really an end, and one of the other endless wars, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Syria being the three really in the Middle East. Now, Lisa, speaking of victims, the death toll from the flooding in Germany and Belgium is closing in on 200. And German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who toured the flood ravaged areas, called what she saw simply terrifying. Yeah, this is this is really, really horrific. You know, uh, you look at the flooding around the world, you don't see numbers like this 200 to die just from from a flooding where there are, um, you know, warnings that come ahead of time. And these people were not able to get out of harm's way. Uh, it's devastating. I know that they're getting help from around the world. Um, many, many sending um, whether it's, you know, humanitarian aid, um, 
money or actual physical help. Uh, and uh, we wish them well in, in really recovering from this and the families who've lost loved ones. It's, just, it's a senseless, senseless death uh, and really upsetting to watch. I mean, Mother Nature can be really um, violent and harsh at times. Absolutely. And in business news, Google has parted ways with an executive following a LinkedIn blog where he posted in June that he confessed to being anti-Semitic in his past. Amr Awadallah was a VP of Developer Relations for Google Cloud. Lisa, this is the second time in two months Google has dismissed employees due to an anti-Semitic past. Yeah, there's so many takeaways from this story, right, Hal? You can say uh, there are many more anti-Semites than we thought. Um, and two, Google does not hire the smartest people in the business as they claim to. It seems to be the most competitive place to get a job, uh, the most you know coveted jobs are at Google, but yet we see these people are, are actually stupid uh, for putting that kind of hate uh, online. And then you know you really think about it and you, you think, well, if these people have such you know high profile jobs um, and they're posting that kind of, of material online, then they really must feel, so passionately about it in order to post it and to risk their jobs and to risk their reputations. Or maybe they think that there is no punishment for anti-Semitism, as many people think, that it's just a free pass where you can talk about uh, Jews as much as you'd like because, you know, others will agree with you or it's just going to be taken, um, you know, with a grain of salt or it'll be, you know, uh, just overlooked. But um, I'm very happy that Google and others, BBC being another company that um, recently fired an individual because of her tweets. Uh, about Jews. Uh, you have doctors and nurses tweeting that they would actually use their powers to kill Jews. Uh, I hope they are all removed. I mean, think about the, the extent of this and replace Jews with any other race or creed or, or culture or religion. And um, it sounds awful. It sounds awful by what with, with any 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 uh, person of any background. So we don't like to see that kind of hate, and we're very happy that Google actually took a stand against this employee. U.S. correspondent and our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, thanks a lot for your time today. My pleasure.